that he was orchestrating perhaps what could be the biggest Ponzi scheme in Canadian history. There's a new case ongoing that has just begun to be investigated in Alberta. That aside, up until that point, the allegations admitted against Mr. Wei Zhentang are that he orchestrated and ran the biggest Ponzi scheme in Canadian history. Could have involved as much as $60 million, according to OSC allegations. As well, if he is found guilty on the 12 charges that he faces, he could face up to 60 years in prison and fines of up to $60 million. He came into our studios yesterday to sit down with me. Perhaps the most interesting component of this is that he came in without legal representation. He was ready to uh, talk off the cuff, to listen to my questions, to answer the questions, and he gave us as much time as we wanted. And did you feel you've got uh, a full disclosure from him? Was he upfront with you in that discussion? I, I think there were moments uh, where he was a little bit less guarded, where you could see the personality come forward. Uh, obviously, he did run quite a bit of money and he was considered a very charismatic person or character among the Chinese Canadian community, especially right here in Toronto. Uh, he ran money for clients out of China. He ran money for Canadian, Chinese Canadian clients here and as well Chinese American clients as far down as Houston. And there were sparks of the sort of charisma that he would have had to have shown for clients, public speaking engagements, that sort of thing. And he did get a, a little bit angry with a, a couple questions or a little bit defensive and then aggressive when it came to answering some of the OSC allegations. And it's certainly important to remember because, you know, ponzimonium as it is being called, this was the first one in this series of them, if you could call it, where it really came home to Canada. Of course, we've been talking about what had been going on with Bernie Madoff, but this was a, you know, I hate to say it, made at home um, problem. And he calls himself, or he has been billed as the Chinese Warren Buffett, and he has a book called The Chinese Warren Buffett. And uh, we, will, we spoke about that book during the course of the interview. He says he never called himself that, though his returns, the returns he promised investors, 1% per week, and that says it right on the book title. Right on the book, right on his website. <laughs> yep. And of course, that was one of the red flags for regulators who went after him at that point in time. So we are going to be speaking with Mr. Wei Zhentang. We will have that interview in its entirety through the course of Market Morning. We will get to the first part of that interview in just a couple of minutes. But in the meantime, of course, we have to get you caught up on all the other business stories we're following this hour. This business update is brought to you by BNN, Business News Network. Celebrating 10 years of outstanding business news coverage. Here are the top business stories we are following this hour at BNN. The Globe and Mail is reporting Canada missed a chance to play host to a global technology giant made up of assets of Nortel Networks and Siemens Enterprise Communications of Germany. Setting unidentified sources in the finance and telecom sectors, the Globe says Industry Canada and Export Development Canada failed to support a bid from Siemens. The German company had proposed to create a Canadian headquartered business with sales of $5 billion a year. Instead, Nortel's manufacturing unit went to US-based Avaya in a court-supervised auction. And a French business newspaper is also reporting that Research in Motion is still, in fact, in the game when it comes to buying the assets of Nortel Networks. RIM co-CEO Michael Azaridis told the paper Nortel's patents and some of its intellectual properties are important to RIM. Lazarita specified the insolvent company's LTE high-speed mobile evolution technologies. Soaring welfare costs and falling tax revenue have sent Britain deep into the red. The country posted its biggest budget deficit in August since modern records began in 1993. The Office for National Statistics says the red income amounts to more than 16 billion pounds, roughly $28 billion. That is almost double the shortfall recorded a year ago. The International Monetary Fund expects Britain's deficit to top 13% of gross domestic product next year. That would be the most in the group of 20 nations. Lloyds Banking Group says it is starting to consider ways it might get out of from under the uh, government's thumb. The UK's biggest mortgage lender says it is discussing potential changes to the terms of the Government Asset Protection Scheme. That's the UK version of a program that ensures risk, risky assets. Lloyds says all possibilities remain open, but many analysts say it is unlikely the bank will be able to abandon government support completely. 
The Wall Street Journal is reporting the U.S. Federal Reserve it will need to approve policies that set the pay for thousands of bank employees across America. This would mark the first time government regulators would have a hand in compensations decisions, which are normally the domain of the bank's boards and, of course, the executives. The plan would allow the Fed to reject any compensation practice it felt encouraged excessive risk-taking. And that is your business update from Business News Network. Now, as we have been saying, Mario, you had the uh, uh, opportunity yesterday to sit down with Mr. Wei Zhang Tang. How did you start the conversation with him? Well, basically, what I wanted to do uh, is to get an idea of how he came to where he was sitting at that time, which is across from me answering questions about allegations. So, first of all, I asked him about how he built his company from managing around $3 million back in the mid 1990s to the OSC's claim that he raised approximately $60 million from 2006 to 2008. Is it is a big money? Uh, uh, I for ten years, or uh, actually for over uh, fifteen years, I spent lots of time on regulation issues, legal issues, l rather than on um, the market, because this is too much burden for small investors like us. I I raised sixty million dollars in three years. It's something, you know. One thing is that's the investor, what the investor need. The second is, see, you see my investor? They all are credit investor, not the public, general public. Now, when you raised that $60 million in just three years, how did you raise that money? Where did that money come from? You know, I, you know, I have, uh, in the beginning, I have lots of uh, uh, good experience, a success, successful story, and people like me, you know. The other thing is the money come from all the business uh, uh, people from Canada, you know, but not Canadian. Most, you know, say the old immigrant from China, the Chinese immigrants from uh, U.S. You know, some your client some, base mostly Chinese immigrants. Yeah, uh, ninety-nine percent. <laughs> And how did you tap into that community? Because it's a growing community in Canada and the United States. Yeah. They arrive and they know about you. How? Yeah, I'm, the first thing is this. I, I, I came here earlier than everybody else, you know, the, before the most people come, you know. The second is in, I'm the one who uh, in the market, you know, I, I talk the language people love to hear. The language people know this is, uh, you know, something. So I, I know everything in the market. I know what the investors need to succeed. Are you at this point in time an accredited financial advisor, an accredited portfolio manager? Yeah. No, at uh, this time, I, I don't know what to, to say this. I spend lots of time on regulation and the legal things, uh, credential, credentials. You know, the things uh, I, so I found out that there is a, a president of a brokerage firm and uh, he, you know, trying to introduce me to his, to be his client. So he gave me the offer referendum, you know, the mm -hmm. prospectors, you know, the private ones. So I, I, when I look at this, oh, this is, looks good, you know. So I use that one. So I, it says if you manage small group of people, or the people you know well, you know well, not in the general public, so, uh, and also uh, accredited investor like hedge fund is not mm -hmm. regulated. So, because OSC want to be regulated, it's fine, but the only problem for them is that they want to find somebody, you know, Ponzi, you know. That's what it is. Because otherwise, OSC... Well, let's stick with the, the, the uh, Ponzi allegations, because that's uh, central. You mentioned the legal issues and how difficult they are right now. There are 12 allegations against you in Canada right now, yeah. um, perhaps the most serious of which is that you were taking money from new investors to pay older investors. That's, uh, how do you respond to that? That's very interesting. Everybody, you know, this is... A, uh, my case is 100% not, not Ponzi. Because the new the, the new invest the, the new money to not a new investor the old one that's the mean for Ponzi schemer you know who use that scheme Ponzi you need to be that's the only thing they do right 
to be, you know, I, I, I don't know any Ponzi before, you know. So what I, I know is everything from the market, you know. So what I learned is to be, I don't know anything about Ponzi. After I be, you know, be charged by OSC, I know. Then I studied Ponzi. So when I studied Ponzi, how can you do not know what is the Ponzi it is? But, Ponzi but has to be the motivation, you know, the purpose and the motivation. And then the Ponzi has no means to make money for investors. The only way is to make one investor's money to another to benefit for the personal benefit. I don't have anything on this. The only thing is, you know, it's a phenomena. Every bank, all the institution, you know, use one money, you know, use one money to, a, uh, to another. But that's not a Ponzi, you know. But the, the money that is coming in from your new clients who are attracted by the website mm -hmm. and, and your returns, historical returns, did any of that money ever end up going to some of the older clients, whether you call it a Ponzi scheme or whatever? But were you, or at some point, necessarily taking some money from new investors to pay off some of the older this investors? Is, uh, this is uh, actually... Uh, you know, people misunderstand and focus on this. This is, you know, it, this is just only a phenomena. It's not a fundamental thing, you know. So it's not a Ponzi, you know. I'm not sure I understand the difference between a phenomenon a rather than a fundamental thing. Yeah, phenomena because for always like just like I, when I go to OIC, you know, the Jeff Thompson, the, the senior investigator, he say, did you, you know, he's he. It, it was him who was anxious to get a Ponzi, you know, scheme, found a Ponzi scheme. But you cannot make everything Ponzi, you know. If, I, if, if ever me being charged or be do as a Ponzi, so all the financial institution is a Ponzi, you know. But all of the returns that your older investors are getting, whether it's from returns in the market or elsewhere, the returns that they're getting is a, a fraction of that, a portion of that, coming from the new money that is coming in from that's new clients, or are uh, all the returns is, coming from market no, performance? No, this is for, for the for your for your news. Uh, you know that all people want you know checking on this new money. Did you put new money to old money? This is not the question, you know. But it's a question but a lot actually, of people are I, interested in, this in is, an answer to. This is, you know, actually, if we have, you know, I, I write a few articles on this, you know, what is what Ponzi look like, what Ponzi should be, what, what Ponzi. But mine, 100% not Ponzi, you know. There's nothing to do with Ponzi. Ponzi people do not know the market. I know the market so well. You ask anybody in the market who know better than me. You know, who know where the market move? Who call the market? You know, on my website, you know, the oil, the Goldman Sachs say the oil will be over $150 to eight. I said, there's no way going there now. This is the time in the market is the top. I'm going to short it. It's 146. I'm short oil with more a hole in my heart. And then on March, Six, I called the, the the world market at the bottom. Nobody would do that. You see my website. I know so much, you know, timing, and so much things about the market, and so much timing of the market. Nobody else comparable to me. You know, if you have any, if you found any system in the market, you know how to time in the market. No, nothing compared to mine. You know, so that's what I. You know, I sell my, you know, I, I try to raise my, my money, you know, to do the things I want to do and to pay, to make the money for investor. You know, I just, for Ponzi is the only way you use other people's money. I, that's a little stupid to me. You know? But what about, the, what about the, the money? 40 to $60 million allegedly lost in the, uh, your, your that's company. God, that's money is, flow. Is that money available to pay investors back? Which one? The 60, 40 to 60 million. Will your investors get all it's of their easy. money no, back? The money actually, you know, the, the, the people, you know, after the accounting, people will know that most of the money already paid the investor back. The only thing, that, you know, the, the, the money I, I, I promised to people, not because I haven't, 
you know, I, I have not done the volume I, I wanted yet. Because this is a strat strategic move. You, the other things I tell you, you know, most people think about, uh, you know, the fraud and the Ponzi things. People do not know how much money I use. You know, I use a little money or no money of investors. So that's tell something big. You know, when my forensic accounting say, forensic accounting, I had a very famous forensic accounting says, if you ask all the reporter, or newspaper, newspaper reporter or reporter from anywhere, come to your house, they you see, no Ponzi live a house like this. Ponzi is to raise the money for the luxury lifestyle, to benefit their own. I do not benefit anything if I do not make money for my investor. The most interesting for me part of all of that is the discussion about you know, he's making money for his investors, that's what he argues, but the definition of, uh, of Ponzi, it got a little uh, foggy there, I thought. <laughs> his, his interpretation, understanding of the definition of Ponzi. His, his definition was perhaps a little bit more clear. It was difficult because he went on and on about it. But all the money from new investors has to go to the older investors in terms of his definition, which is why I asked him if any money went that way. And he said, that's not the point, <laughs> uh, which is a, a very interesting response. And of course, our conversation is going to continue with Mr. Wei Zhang Tang in uh, we will begin that again at around 10 o'clock and it gets quite a bit better as well because we're going to go right into the allegations against him and we're going to discuss the OSC charges what he thinks about the OSC and perhaps some of the things he thinks he needs to do to get back on his feet again he continues to face 12 charges and those charges could result 60 years in prison and fines of up to 60 million dollars he sat down with me yesterday the the rest of that interview will be a little bit later on the show. But of course, before all that, we have the market open. And coming up next, we're going to get you a start on the trading day. So stay with us. Market Morning is brought to you by Claymore ETFs, low-cost intelligent investing. With bonds, lower cost really does matter. Claymore 1 to 5 year laddered government bond ETF and 1 to 5 year laddered corporate bond ETF. Canada's lowest cost bond funds, period. Claymore ETFs, intelligent investing. A practical approach leads to sensible business decisions. Combining practicality with creativity leads to real innovation. Is your law firm preparing your business for the future? Fraser Milner Casgrain, your future is our business. Is there a mortgage for savers? There should be, since millions of Canadians want a mortgage that costs less and gets them mortgage-free sooner. But do other mortgages make that possible? Not really. So ING Direct created the Unmortgage, the mortgage for savers. Everything about the Unmortgage is designed to help you save. You pay as little interest as possible because you always get our lowest rate without haggling ever. You also get flexible repayment options to make you mortgage-free sooner. You can add to any regular payment anytime. If you have some extra cash, make a larger payment. Even $20 a week can save you thousands and shorten your mortgage. Are you a saver? Then call now or visit unmortgage.ca. We'll show you how simple it is to get the unmortgage. And when you finalize your online application, an unmortgage expert will be dedicated to you every step of the way. Call or go online. Save your money. Nortel Networks and Siemens came pretty close to forming a Toronto-based phone gear maker, but the plan collapsed because of a lack of support from Ottawa, at least according to a report in the Globe and Mail today. And Paul Bagnell's been digging into this story. More controversy around Nortel. Nortel will uh, haunt us. Uh, you, get it for, you get the feeling for years to come. This is about the uh, recent sale of the enterprise business. The enterprise business is the business that makes uh, phone gear for corporations. Uh, and the sale has, uh, of course, recently uh, been made to Avea of New Jersey. There are reports today 
that Avea is going to cut some jobs uh, here in Canada. A great piece of reporting today by Andy Willis in the Globe and Mail uh, saying that Siemens and its enterprise division had a, a plan in place to uh, merge with the Nortel enterprise division, headquarter of the company uh, right here in Canada. That would involve some movement of, uh, of uh, business assets from Germany to Canada, uh, but the deal fell apart according to sources uh, speaking to Andy Willis uh, because uh, Ottawa would not step up with financing uh, from the Export Development uh, Corporation. One source, uh, unnamed, uh, who uh, spoke to uh, Andy Willis uh, said if this was France, they would have fallen all over themselves to support this concept of a global champion in tech. So uh, certainly uh, an apparent uh, lack of will in Ottawa, getting some uh, pretty stern criticism from some people involved in what we understand was a deal between uh, Siemens and Nortel. A plan, I shouldn't say a deal, but a plan. Of course, this is not France. So <laughs> why, did, uh, why did Siemens not outbid Avaya? Well, S Siemens' view was that Avaya was willing to pay a premium to keep uh, other competitors out of its uh, home North American market and that Siemens uh, had a number that they were willing to, uh, to pay, uh, but they were not willing to go past that. The, the critics uh, in, in this case say that uh, were the Export Development Corporation able to swing a loan of some $300 million, that apparently was the, uh, the number that was uh, under discussion, uh, that this deal could have happened between uh, Siemens and Nortel. Okay, what about has there been any response from the Ontario government? Well, the Ontario government apparently was uh, fully in favor of it. Uh, I'm not sure how much uh, actual hard support they would have lent to the uh, government uh, uh, to the deal, but uh, uh, the uh, the industry minister of Ontario actually quoted in the paper as saying that they they favored the deal and were willing to lend some kind of support to it. The Export Development Corporation says that they did not uh, turn tail on this deal be, because of uh, comments made by uh, Research in Motion at the er in the earlier uh, Nortel auction. What, what some people believe is that. After Jim Balsilli characterized uh, uh, Canada as supporting foreigners in the earlier Nortel <coughs> auction, that uh, the government got cold feet about uh, quote unquote supporting foreigners in this transaction. The, again, the EDC denies that was the case, but that's uh, what some people have suggested to the Globe. Jim Balsley, always in the middle right. somewhere. All right, thanks, thanks. Paul. Paul Bagnall. So let's get everybody caught up on uh, what's going on overseas as we head. Uh, we're just a few minutes away from the North American Open now. Well, in the Far East, it seems relatively quiet around the world. Economic statistics are lacking, a lot of, not a lot of corporate news. But the overseas markets in the Far East were quite weak. You can see uh, the Hang Seng down about two-thirds of a percentage point. Shanghai and Shenzhen down by more than 3%. So some very uh, weak markets. It's there coming into Europe uh, soft I would uh, call them but they are in the green up about uh, a fifth of uh, a point uh, percentage wise you can see the markets there but again not a whole lot on the news front coming into New York of course it's quadruple witching a lot of the positioning happened yesterday the markets look like they want to trade higher there were some big upgrades I'm going to tell you about on the Dow uh, so that is helping that index and and uh, we'll see if the futures are right in about seven minutes. Let's check with the commodities right now and see how they're performing. The U.S. are a little bit stronger today against most currencies. We'll see if that holds in at all. But we have oil completely unchanged this morning. It's $72.47. Gasoline unchanged. Tell you, uh, that is a quiet day. Natural gas, though, up 3%, so extending its rally, though it did have a bit of a down day yesterday. We'll have a look at the metals now and see how they are performing today. We have gold, silver, and copper. Gold and silver performing a little bit better. $1,017 an ounce for the price of gold this morning. We have the price of copper, though, down 5 cents. And taking a look at the Canadian dollar, here's the Canadian dollar a little bit stronger, but again, almost unchanged, trading at 93.76 U.S. cents. And let's take a look at the bond market, which is weak in price, stronger in yield. Here you can see both in Canada and the United States. For reference, the U.S. 10-year Treasury started at uh, 335. So uh, weakness for the whole week in the bond market. And we've got some stocks to watch coming up. Stay with us. Hi, there aren't any towels in my room. Continue. Friendly service. Real value from your friends at Hampton by Hilton. It's the perfect name. Escape. Let's go. Anywhere. The Ford Escape. 8-inch ground clearance. Intelligent four-wheel drive. Infotainment. Every safety feature available in the Escape. Standard. It's fun to drive. Comes in a V6. 
four-cylinder or hybrid. It's the most fuel-efficient SUV on the planet. My buddy. I drive one. I drive one. I drive one. The new 2010 Escape. This is Ford.